Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for another opportunity to come together to share in your truth, to go through your word, to look at all that you have called us to do. We thank you for the favor that you've given us, even though we don't deserve it. Given the grace and mercy that you've extended to us so that we can rise above the falls and we can walk according to your truth. We thank you for the gospel, the the word that you've provided us through your disciples, through your, the first apostles, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the Old Testament that helps us understand the truth of why we needed Christ, why we needed all that you've allowed us to have. And we thank you knowing that this word through the leadership of the Holy Spirit will do exactly what you said and not return to you void. We give you glory and honor. In your name, Yahushua the Christ, we pray. Amen. So, we're going to talk about the remnants. Who are the remnants and why you need to know who they are? There's a lot of preachers today, Christians, pastors and elders, different people uh, who say they believe in the Bible, who declare themselves to be the remnant. And we as believers need to know who these individuals are. And I'm going to tell you why, as we go along, why we need to know who they are. But let's first talk about what is the remnant. When we look at the history of God throughout the Bible, whenever he had released judgment or whenever he went called his people to go against the enemy or whenever he did something for uh, his chosen people or through his chosen people, he never picked the masses. He didn't pick the people who were had it all together and they, you know, they look like they fit the part. He always picked the people who were the least likely or the group of people or they went up against a situation that we can say were the underdogs in the in the, whatever the battle may have been, whatever the situation may be. And the Bible tells us the reason why God does this is because he has chosen the foolish things to confound the wise. He doesn't, God doesn't pick the, the big, strong, well, sophisticated, educated, uh, person who looks like they would be the one. He picks the one, uh, that would, in the end, you would say, well, you know what? How did that person get selected? To how was this person was able to do the things that they were able to do? And God does this so that he gets glory in the end. He doesn't do it in a way or doesn't allow us to happen in a way. Where somebody can say, I did it. I was skilled enough or I had enough uh, training or knowledge or whatever the case may be. It happened because God made it happen. The Bible tells us that he wants the glory. He is a consuming fire and that he doesn't share his glory with a single person. And we can look back at even before the creation of man, when Lucifer was in heaven, his pride allowed him to or, or led him to uh, manipulate a third of the angels. And his objective was to create a revolt that he believed was going to allow him to take over heaven. He was going to take the throne of, of God, sit in his, his place of authority. And, uh, it didn't work out. He was defeated. Michael came against him. He was, he was, he was knocked out of heaven. He was cast down. Christ said, I saw him fall like lightning from, a, uh, lightning from the sky to the earth. You know, and the remnant for us in this day is important for us to realize who they are. Uh, we, you know, when you look at Judges chapter seven, uh, Gideon, he was he had the, the the Israelites under his command, and he was going up against the Midianites. And God told him there were too many, so he had too many people in order for me to use to go against the Midianites. And he said the reason why. And chapter seven, verse two is because the people would basically say, you know, we were able to do it. It was because of our hands, our skills that we beat the Midianites. So God said to everybody that was afraid or fearful, fearful to go home, go on back. Uh, we don't, I don't need you. And when he told them that 2000, excuse me, 22,000 had went away and there were 10,000 that remained. And even after that, God said, you still have too many people. So take them down and, and have them drink water. And he's, he was separated the two groups, the ones who laid on their bellies and drink water like a dog from the group that took a knee and 
use their hands to drink water. And the group that was more conservative, if you want, if you will, were told to, hey, you guys did make the team your cut. Go ahead and, and leave. And when it was all said and done, there was only 300 left. And obviously 300 against the mighty people, the Midianites, doesn't look like it makes any sense. But because of this, the way God operates, it made perfect sense in his thinking, his thought process and how he does things. And their obedience to what God had commanded allowed them to be victorious against the Midianites. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 11, he says, I say then, has God cast away his people? Certainly not. For I also am an Israelite, the seed of Abraham and the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away his people who he foreknew. Or do you not know what the scripture says of Elijah, how he pleaded plead with God against Israel, saying, Lord, they have killed your prophets and tore down your altars, and I alone am left, and they seek my life. But what does the divine response say to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed a knee to Baal. Even so, then, in this present time, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. So Paul's telling us that in this season, this present time, this end times, right? And when you look at when they're talking about seasons and times, when Paul makes mention of Peter and Christ, we're talking about the day Jesus Christ rose from the grave. That started the inevitable countdown to the final day uh, in time, right? To when Jesus Christ would return, the Messiah would return and and and, and pick his people out of the, the great suffering that that's that's coming and would allow the, the the wrath of God will come in and obviously be poured out on the land he's saying that there's a people that have been selected through grace then what does he mean by through grace it's not the remnant of the Old Testament uh, the remnant of where you had to basically fit a certain description based on how you act based on how you carry yourself the grace that he gives, he's talking about through Christ, or we were saved by grace through faith. He's saying that we are, there's a remnant that exists today that because of the grace, meaning that we don't deserve to be the remnant and we're not God's, there, there are people that are not God's original people. He had chosen them through Christ to be the, the, the residue, what's left over, what is the final group of people, uh, for this season. Now, as I've said before, there's a lot of preachers out there who are hosting these remnant conferences, these, uh, you know, taking care of the flock uh, services. And, and when you look at what Paul said about what God told, um, Elijah that he had 7,000 reserved for him, he said, who have not bowed a knee to Baal. When you go to first Kings chapter 19, uh, and starting off in, in the beginning of the chapter, it talks about how, you know, Elijah had already defeated these. He, he went up against uh, the prophets of Baal and this, comp, this wasn't a, you know, so much of a competition because you can't compete with God. But this battle, if you will, where God showed up and uh, was flawless and proved that he is the only true living God. Uh, after the victory, Elijah killed all the prophets. Jezebel hears about it from King Ahab, and now she's after him. She's out to get Elijah. Elijah takes off running because he becomes afraid. He goes and hides in a cave, and God shows up, and he says to him, he said, I have been zealous. In, in verse 14, he says that I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, because the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and, and they seek to take my life. And this is why Elijah takes off running. But then the Lord tells him this. God tells him, he said, listen, go and return your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you are there, anoint Hazel as a king over Syria. And you shall anoint Jeru, the son of Nemesis, as king over Israel. And Elijah, the son of Shaphat, and Abel, Meholah you shall anoint as prophet in your place. Now, there was a whole shift of command that was happening here. And God was obviously doing a new thing. 
He already told him to go back. And he tells him before he he explains to him what he has set up back where he left, he tells him to have Eliza replace his uh replace him as a prophet. Now, the reason why God does this is because Elijah takes off running. When God meets him in the cave, he asks him, he said, what are you doing here? Elijah should have never left, but he was under the impression that he was alone by himself and there's no one else left. And he figured he wasn't going to be able to stand like, like we've all probably been in situations before. We think we are um, in this battle alone, we're dealing with whatever the enemy tries to attack us with financially, mentally, emotionally, a loss of a loved one. And we feel like we're lonely and we're in this battle all by ourselves. But the truth is, the Bible says that there are brothers and sisters all over the world who are dealing with the same problems. They're dealing with the same situations. And after God tells Elijah to do to basically change command with all these individuals, in verse 18, he says, yet I have reserved 7,000 in Israel who whose knee have not bowed to Baal and every mouth that has not kissed him. Now, what is God saying here? Obviously, we've all heard the, the, you know, the phrase, or we should have at least heard the phrase where it says they haven't bowed their knee. Obviously, bowing your knee, if you look at anything from the, you know, the, the ancient days, there, it was a, it was a sign of servitude. They've looked at it and said, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and serve this king, this, whoever the person was in authority. And he also goes on and says that every mouth that has not kissed him. So there's a, these are two different categories here. One, the, the bowing of the knee is complete servitude. And two, the kissing is in that day was a way to greet someone, to welcome them. And today we have a lot of Christians who don't necessarily fit the bill on the outside of bowing their knee to Baal, but they have kissed him. They have greeted him into the, their life. And we see this when we look at uh, a lot of the ministers today, particularly uh, the, the mega church ministers, these big uh, conferences type setups where they might, e- they might even preach against homosexuality. Uh, they'll preach against child abortion. They'll preach against all the different things. But when you look at their lifestyle, they may not be out selling drugs or committing crimes or and I even be cheating on their spouses, but then they live a lavish life. They live as if they are not even a minister. And people say, well, you know, what's wrong with having millions of dollars? What's wrong with having a multi-million dollar home and luxurious cars? There's a lot wrong with that. If you call yourself a watchman, a preacher, an elder, a deacon, when you look at the first century church, they didn't have this kind of lifestyle. They didn't live in such a way that they had all their needs met, but yet their members, their congregation, or those who were of their church were struggling to have their needs met. They were struggling to uh, deal with mental problems or whatever the case may be, while the apostle Paul or Peter were just basically living it up. They didn't roll in for a church service on Sunday, give out a quote unquote word for, from God, and then go back to their fabulous home, right? Preaching to people who some couldn't even afford to show up to church. We are in a season where deception has led people to believe that because they have attended or continue to attend church, that they are somehow the remnant. Well, when a, when Jezebel had introduced Baal, this false god. The only people she went after to devour were the prophets. And the reason why she went after the prophets was because they were God's chosen people. They were the ones who were called by God to give the messages, the word, to lead the people as God had commanded. Same with Elijah. She wasn't concerned about those who just a part of the family, you know, the the attendees, if you will, the the everyday Israelite. She was more concerned with those who had a effect on the people, God's people. And unfortunately, there are those who who bowed to her, bowed down to her, those leaders, those prophets. 
they gave in to the lie, you know, and there were those who resisted and were killed. Now, we don't know how God preserved those 7,000 of Israel. It doesn't say specifically in the Bible, um, but you can definitely look at the scripture and tell that it wasn't their time to come forward and stand against Jezebel. He hadn't called them out yet. Were they in training still or were they just being uh, held back, hiding or whatever the case may be? It does, the Bible doesn't tell us that. But what we can look at, too, is that those who served, who, who, who sat at the table with Jezebel, those prophets, those are the ones who have either bowed the knee or kissed Baal or welcomed him into their life. We need to know who the remnant are, those who are the few, because if we don't, we can end up like Elijah, taking off running, thinking we're the only ones. Of course, we can say God is faithful. We know that. We know he will never leave us. He'll never forsake us. But the Bible tells us that as we see the day approaching, meaning the signs of the time, the wars, rumors of war, sickness, pestilence, earthquakes, signs in the sky, raging seas. He said, encourage each other the more. He didn't say isolate yourself because you're the remnant or isolate yourself, whatever, because maybe you're afraid. He said, encourage each other. You know, and, and Elijah took off too soon because even when he left worried about Jezebel, he it, you can tell here he wasn't thinking about Elijah who ended up taking his place and later on um, destroyed Jezebel. Everybody who says they are a believer is not truly a believer. Everyone who says they are a Christian is not so. There are many people who are following preachers who have given in to falsehood. They teach a doctrine that doesn't exist in the Bible. And Paul made mention of this. He said, he told Timothy, he said, when he leaves, he said, they were, these people will come in like, like savage wolves and they will not spare the flock. And he's talking about not just the financial side of the lives of the members who attend these churches, but the, the faith side, the spiritual side. He will tell them that at the end of the day, these false teachers and preachers will tell them that they don't need to trust God when it comes to their health, their finances, walking in the will of God. That's what you have doctors for. That's why you have counselors. That's why you have lawyers and all these different things that they will say to help justify them staying in a position of authority. And I was talking to my mom the other day about Bishop T.D. Jakes and how for years he's always given these strategies of how to become wealthy, how to get your blessing, how God is going to, you know, do these certain steps and strategies. At the end of the day, most people who've been attending his church for years have never seemed to crack that code. And the reason being is because he's not going to give you the absolute truth because one or two things are going to happen. One, you're going to see clearly he's a, he's a fraud. He's not a true minister when he tells you exactly how he became wealthy. Or two, you're going to try that strategy for yourself and then find out it doesn't work. Most people don't take into consideration the wealth he has is because people just keep showing up, putting money in the church, buying his books, showing up for the movies he helped produce, watching him on TV. And the same goes for all these other ministers who are out here living these lavish lives and saying they are the shepherds of the flock. Anytime you looked at a shepherd in scripture, they didn't live like that. Uh, they didn't walk around with the best of the best. You know, the apostle Paul had a job. He was a tent maker. And the purpose is that he didn't burden the church. He didn't burden the people who were coming there to be a part of the ministry, to, to be t transformed, to be saved from this wicked land, this wicked world. Who are we walking with? Who are we listening to? We have to ask ourselves, have we bowed a knee to Baal? Have we welcomed him, him into our life? Because in a day, it's all about compromise. We can say, well, you know, we love the Lord and we worship him and he's true. He's God and he's holy. He's sovereign. But does that actually show up in our life? Do we keep popping on these false preachers who we know are ungodly ministers, entertaining whatever it is that they're talking about? We are supposed to be ye separate, come from among them. And the Bible clearly tells us that when God comes for his, when he sends Christ for his church, 
for his people. They cannot have this compromised heart, this adulterous mentality, this adulterous spirit where we are believing in God, but at the end of the day, we cheat a little bit with false doctrine. We cheat a little bit with the word that doesn't actually line up with the word because, you know, for the longest time, that was my favorite preacher. Uh, that was my old school church buddies or whatever the case may be. He is looking for a people who will serve and worship him wholly, completely, utterly. He's not looking for, he, he, he can't, the Bible says, Christ said, when he comes, will he find faith on the earth? You know, we, we, Christ is looking for faith on the earth. He is looking for people who are absolutely dependent upon him. The fruit that he said, if you remain in me, he said, you will produce much fruit and much fruit. The fruit he's talking about isn't the saving of souls. That's only possible through Christ. The fruit he is talking about is complete dependence on him, 100% faith in all areas of our life. That is the remnant. Those are the remaining people in the earth who he is called to be witnesses, to be evidence, to be the truth, to not bow down to the compromised lifestyle of this progressive false Christianity that has swept many people off their feet. You know, I see it so much. I've had so many conversations with people who say, well, you know, you just have to love people and be kind. I, I agree with that a hundred percent. But how did Jesus Christ love people and how was he kind to them? The most loving and kind thing you can do to, to someone biblically is to tell them to repent. Tell them God will not accept a life of homosexuality, of stealing, a heart that's connected to the world. That's true love. Love is honest. Love looks you right in the eye and is blunt. It doesn't sh hide around the corner and, sh and and shade around the truth because don't you know you don't want to offend anybody. You don't want to hurt their feelings. We have to remember what the word of God is. The Bible says that it is a sword and it's designed to cut. That's what a sword is designed for. And it's a double edged sword. So it's going to hurt going both ways, but we need the sword in our life, the word of God, so that he can prune us, prepare us, get us ready to produce more fruit and ultimately to spend eternity with him. So I ask again, who are you associated with that is living contrary to the word of God? Now, I'm not talking about your employees or your coworkers or, or people in your community. I'm talking about the church folks. Because when you look at it, those people who bowed the knee, who kissed Baal, they didn't all just do it at once. We all know how peer pressure works. You look over to your left and you see someone else doing it. You look to your right, see someone else doing it. You figure, hey, it's not that bad. Why not just go ahead and join in? And that's where we're at in society today. A lot of church institutions, you show up and you say, well, you know what? That wasn't really what the Bible said. But hey, you know what? There's, there's 2,000 people here. So at least most of it must be right. Hey, this guy's always on TV or this person is wealthy or whatever the case may be. They look like the anointing. They look like the blessing of God. This is why I'm so glad God gave us his word so we can go back to scripture and validate what truth is, what being a disciple actually looks like. What does it really mean to follow Christ? You know, Jesus Christ said, if you don't take up your cross and follow me, then you're not worthy of me. But what does that actually mean? Well, we can go back to the word and we can look at how Jesus carried his cross and how the disciples after him carry their cross. So when we are walking through whatever it is we're going through, uh, storms or even the good times, we can align ourselves with the truth to know, OK, this is what I need to do. This is what I need to do to make sure I am doing to walk out the truth, to be in line, to be the remnant according to grace. Again, that grace, he selected a remnant. We don't deserve it. We're not like, uh, to a certain extent, most of us are not even anything like Elijah or um, Gideon or any of these people that God has chosen because of the way they carry themselves. Most of us, we can all probably testify that we, at one point, maybe a little bit of our life or extended part of our life, we wanted nothing to do with God. We wanted nothing to do with his word, being holy, walking holy. But that grace was there to give us 
an opportunity to get completely in line with him. If this was before the grace of God, we wouldn't even be considered a remnant. It would have been just like those uh, 22,000 that was afraid and say, you know what? I'm out of here. I'm not going up against the Midianites. Or we could have been like the other um, ones who were conservative. They took a knee. They were more worried about, you know, how this look in front of people. Yeah, I, I don't want to look too messy. I don't want to be embarrassed. So let me just kind of make sure I'm, you know, fitting in with the crowd, you know, or we could even be as, as, as bad as it gets and have a seat at the table with Jezebel and just completely renounce God. But that grace is such an amazing, such an amazing thing that none of us could ever take for granted if we truly understood what it meant. I can tell you for myself, you know, being someone who grew up in church, I, I got to a place in my life where I wanted nothing to do with reading my Bible, praying or anything to that effect. You know, I, I was like, you know what? I'm trying to get to the NFL. I want to be in law enforcement, all these different things I wanted to do. You know, and I carry God along every now and then and pulled him out of my pocket whenever I was going through something, needed a prayer or needed a miracle, whatever the case may be. But ultimately, there were times in my life where, you know, oh, yeah, that's right. The Bible. Mm, God. Yep. Church. Right. So thankfully, through his grace, we've been able to see. The sad part is that a lot of people have still have saw it, what we see, and reject it and say, I'm just going to keep carrying down this road. And in this season that we're living in, where deception is at its highest and has ever been, uh, many false Christs and false prophets have risen. The world is in greater turmoil than ever before. The last thing we need to do is reject the call that God has given us or harden our hearts against repentance and holiness and righteousness. But we have to know who is the remnant. That's important. That is essential in this season. Don't believe the, the hype. Don't believe the, the sound, the noise, and the show. We have to look at how people are carrying themselves. Are they preaching the unadulterated word of God? Are they teaching straight from the Bible or, or are they adding their own perspectives? What they think or feel about God's word, what they assume, what they believe is the best interpretation of his word. We're going to see a lot more of this as we journey towards the return of Jesus Christ. Um, as the world continues to turn upside down and go sideways, we're going to see more people that are going to come out and they're going to be offering you opportunities to be shepherd, to overcome, to rise above. And there's some, some of them going to have the, the right off the bat telltale signs. You want to experience the Holy Ghost explosion, come on in here for $150. That should be a no-brainer right there, right? Peddling the gospel, Paul talked about that. But then you're also going to have those who are not going to charge a fee. They're going to be calm and cool, smooth talking, easy going. And they're going to say a few things that's going to rub you a certain way. You're like, wait a minute, that don't sound right. Now, what are we going to do about that? Are we going to get in that Bible? Are we going to vet what they say? Or are we going to be like, you know, those who um, have, have, have compromised and say, you know, I guess, you know, they maybe they made a mistake. Maybe they, you know, maybe they were a little bit off. I, I get they're young and they don't really, maybe they don't know. No way does that happen with someone who God is called to, to minister, to teach, to preach, who is led by the spirit of God. There is no errors in teaching God's word. You may stumble over pronouncing some names. Uh, you, you may not grab a, uh, uh, you may skip a sentence while you're reading it. But at the end of the day, you're not going to take the word of God and flip it around and say that uh, something completely against his truth, something that we can't find and uphold in the Bible. You know, I, I, I've heard people say so many things in these recent months that just, and, and the crowd goes wild. I'm like, wait a minute. That nowhere, that's nowhere in the scripture. Nowhere. But that's their favorite preacher. Hey, the event was off the chain. The the crowd, the, the choir was was just off. They're, they're, they're wonderful today. They were so amazing. The preacher seemed to be just on it. He was sweating and yelling and hooping and hollering. Nope. We gotta go to the word of God. Identify the truth. Know the truth. Those 7,000 in Israel, they knew the truth. They knew because God had reserved them. They didn't just know, but they applied it. They didn't compromise 
because everyone else was doing it. It was a cool thing to do. They were a remnant saved for the will of God, for the purpose of God, because they had a complete heart for God. So let's check our heart as we continue walking out the will of God. Let's look at how we carry ourselves every single day. There will not be a moment in this faith where you get to a place where you don't have to anymore. If you ever get there, you've been deceived. If you ever get, if you think you got to a place where you don't know you need to study the word for yourself or, or, or pray, pray for yourself and test everything you hear, then, then sadly the enemy has hoodwinked you. We have to continue in the word of God. We have to continue. The Bible says, do not grow weary in well doing. That well doing also applies to how we study his word, how we uh, think and what comes out of our mouth and you, you name it. It all goes together. It all goes hand in hand. The whole man, the whole person. The Bible says uh, unjust weights is an abomination to God. We can't have an awesome prayer life, but we don't witness. We can't uh, have a, a a great Bible study uh, uh, training, but then we don't take the time to uh, share our testimony about what God has done. He wants the entire heart. We're completely committed to him. And that, again, is how you understand who are the remnants. So we're not led astray and deceived in this final hour, in this final time. So be encouraged in this in these last days, you know, that word right there, those two words, last days, scare a lot of people. I talk to people all the time and I say, you know, you better get right with God. He's coming back and he's not looking for anybody that's half stepping. And sadly, that'd be the last time I talk to a lot of people. But I have to do exactly what he called me to do. I don't want no blood on my hands. I'm going to preach the gospel. I'm going to tell the truth. If you don't like it, it ain't me. And I was talking to my nephew earlier before I got on. Uh, to do this, uh, this, this, this talk. And he said, man, they really don't like you on Facebook, huh, uncle? I say, you know what? I said, it's not me. It's, it's the gospel. That's what I share. I don't, I don't share my opinion. I don't share what I think. Now, are there some things I think and want to say? Absolutely. But then I would quench the Holy Spirit and no longer be effective in that setting or in that conversation with that individual. So I have to refrain from what I want to say and do and let the spirit lead me to give them the truth. Some people accept it. A lot of people turn from it. But as as he told his uh, prophets, those who he called to be watchmen, he said, "If you don't tell them, so and they and they fall, they they go to, they end up under becoming defeated." He said, "That blood becomes your responsibility." So us out here who are called to speak and be the light and the salt of the earth, as we all are, being the uh, those of Jesus Christ, those of the Messiah, we need to be bold, be fearless, let the Holy Spirit lead us, humble ourselves so he can use us and refute all that the enemy wants to do to destroy not just uh, those who are um, walking circumspectly, but also destroy those completely who are straddling the fence to get them to make a full cross over to the other side. So be encouraged. Let's walk according to the truth. Allow the spirit of almighty Yah to guide us in this wicked season. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for this day. Thank you for blessing us. Thank you for keeping us. Thank you for watching over us with the truth. Thank you for sending your angels constantly as an encampment all around us, keeping us from danger seen and unseen. We thank you knowing that the enemy has no authority, has no power, has no ability to stop the people of God from being the people of God. We thank you for the truth. We thank you for the remnant who understands this truth by way of your spirit. We give you the glory and the honor in your holy name, Yahusha, the Christ, the Messiah, we pray. Amen.